Good afternoon. I'm delighted and honored to have Charlotte Collins, Senior Vice President of Policy and Programs for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, and Dr. Michael Pistoner, KFA Medical Advisor and co-creator of AllergyHome.org here with us today. This webinar is offered by Kids with Food Allergies as part of its Education Outreach Program. I'm Linda Mitchell, Vice President of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation. I run the Kids with Food Allergies Division, and I have the privilege of being your moderator again today. Presenters for all of our webinars are doing so as volunteers and without compensation. On behalf of KFA, I'm very grateful to Charlotte and Dr. Mike to donate their time to be here with us. I have a few housekeeping details to run through before we get started. First of all, today's webinar is made possible through a sponsorship from Mylan Specialty. We rely on donors and corporate partners like Mylan Specialty for the financial support that enables us to develop education programs for families. And next, please remember that this webinar is of a general nature only and is not medical or legal advice. You should consult your own physician for any medical advice you seek with regard to food allergies and any other medical conditions. This webinar is being recorded and we'll send you a follow-up email in a few days with a link to that recording. Later in today's webinar, we'll stop to give away gifts from our corporate supporters, Sun Butter and Dr. Lucy. The recipients of these gifts will be picked randomly from those still in attendance later on in the webinar. And when we end the webinar, you will see a survey. Please share your impressions with us as we will take your feedback very seriously to help improve the future direction of our series. We will be running some polls this afternoon, and so I'm going to ask Melanie to go ahead and start them now. Um, and then what I'd like to do is turn the floor over to our speakers, Charlotte and Dr. Mike, so that they can get started with the program. So um, you can go ahead and just keep taking the polls as Charlotte begins her presentation, and then we'll show you the results as soon as they're available. So um, thanks, Charlotte, for joining us. I'm delighted and honored for you to be here, and I'd like for you to just get started when you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Linda, for inviting me to present at this webinar. We, what I'm going to focus on is the state honor roll of um, asthma and allergy policies for schools, and that is a report that we do annually to help uh, assess how states are using um, laws and policies to protect students with, food, with allergy and food allergies and asthma. So this is a very busy time of year. Uh, we had a chance to uh, present this report, again, for seven straight years, and we like to get it out in time for back to school because um, it's, it is a very busy time. We know that many parents um, have some anxiety, and we hope that this report will help to mitigate some of the anxiety that most parents feel, but especially those parents whose children uh, have food allergies. So it's a natural time of year for parents to ask questions about whether their school-aged children are safe at school. Can they carry their epinephrine, epinephrine auto-injectors and administer them in an emergency? And if they don't have one or they find that they've left theirs behind and, uh, and off of their person in their locker or maybe even in a backpack or in the car, does the school keep these life-saving devices on hand? Are schools tracking health emergencies? Do schools in, in your state practice sound indoor air quality management to help reduce asthma and allergic reactions? Your school may ban smoking in school buildings, but what about on school buses and at off-campus activities? These and other questions may be top of mind to parents now and throughout the school year. So the topics that I'm going to cover um, in my presentation include an overview of the State Honor Roll Report, what's new in the 2014 report, progress and gaps, and uh, how to use the State Honor Roll to improve school health policies. And in that section, I'll demonstrate how you can use this powerful tool to improve health policies in your state. Okay, um, Linda, I think we need to move to the slide deck. I'm not seeing it right now. Great. And if we can move to do it, if I've got control, just say yes. Okay, I don't think I have control of the slide deck. Uh, 
Maybe I do. Great, I do. I, I do have control. Uh, thanks, your, thanks for your indulgence. The goals of this report, you know, really, just to be straight, this report is focused on the needs of parents, lawmakers, school staff, and professionals, at, with the primary focus being parents. And we focus on parents um, by helping them assess policies that might be present in their schools. And I had a, a person, a parent called me several years ago before we got this report um, launched in 2008. And she said, my principal said that my child can't keep her medicine with her uh, while she's at school. Well, I said, well, you know, it's kind of ridiculous because your state requires that parents have a right to carry their medications at school. So what we wanted to do was to create a credible tool that parents can go to to assist them, not only as they advocate to improve their state policies, but to find out what the policies are in their state in the first place. It's also a tool that we intended for lawmakers to use so that they can look to what other states are doing as they try to model bills in their states that are helpful. And finally, we're also looking, um, one of our goals is to assist school staff and professionals at school as they try to develop best practices for improving the school experience. Okay. Charlotte, I just want to jump in and just let you know, Melanie is advancing the slides for you, but um, there is a delay with GoToMeeting right now. So if you need a slide, just let her know and she'll try. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And this is exactly where I need to be, uh, Melanie, thank you. In creating the state honor roll package, we began with the question of, you know, why do we want to do this anyway? It, it is uh, a major endeavor and uh, it requires a, a good deal of research about what's going on in state in um, all 50 states and we also look at the District of Columbia. But in this activity we saw the need for a comprehensive roundup of helpful medication awareness and school environment policies all in one place. We see this as providing an incentive for states by using positive reinforcement and the positive reinforcements enforcement of an, of an awards program rather than a list that says, you know, these are the worst activities. So we want to actually highlight the states that are doing the best job across a whole array of helpful policies. We see this as a tool that points to preferred policies and best practices based on the input that we've received from experts in the field about what are the best um, policies. And as schools improve, based on what's good for asthma and allergy students, it's our hope that the level of healthfulness for other students um, with other conditions will also improve. Next slide. So next we're going to take a look at uh, some of the standards, the policy standards that we assess uh, in a, in coming up with this report. And our core policy standards fall into three categories. The first is medication and treatment policies. And those are listed on the slide in front of you as general, um, general categories. So we include um, physician, physicians written instruct, instructions and whether the schools are required to keep them on file in order to dispense prescription medications for students. We look at students' right to carry and self-administer uh, their prescribed medications. And the, the shortcut to this is that at this point, all states require us, uh, allow students to self-carry and self-administer their anaphylaxis and asthma medications. One exception is New York State. And that really is the only exception, and that is that there is not a state law on the books um, requiring schools to allow self-carry and self-administration for anaphylaxis medications. But the state of New York has uh, a bunch of activity around trying to change that right now. Uh, one of the other areas that we look at as a core policy standard is maintaining asthma and allergy incident reports for reactions, attacks, and medications administered. And we also look at um, whether states require schools to have emergency protocols for anaphylaxis and asthma. Uh, and an important area that we look at relates to access to, to care in schools. And that is whether school nurses are available for students during the school day. 
What we recommend is consistent with a recommendation by the National Association of School Nurses, and that is a nurse-to-student ratio of one nurse per 750 pupils or better. And finally, we look at Good Samaritan policies, and those are laws that protect individuals who, in innocence and in good faith, try to assist someone having a health emergency. An example is someone trying to assist someone who's, ha who's having an anaphylaxis episode by administering um, an epinephrine auto-injector. And we want to make sure that people at school, school staff um, and others, don't hesitate to administer this life-saving, potentially life-saving uh, medication the minute that an anaphylaxis, that anaphylaxis is suspected. Next slide. So these are the other two categories, awareness in schools and school environment. And the second category of awareness in school, we really look at whether the state, through its um, laws, is recognizing and addressing uh, asthma and, al and anaphylaxis as issues in the schools. And with respect to the school environment, our policy standards look at and assess indoor air quality policies, uh, pesticide notification, or even more preferable, integrated pest management policies and whether those practices are in place. Inspecting um, heating um, air conditioning systems regularly to ensure that there are not issues with them that may cause uh, un uh, indoor, um, diminished indoor air quality. And we're also looking at smoking bans on campus and whether all school activities, whether smoking is banned at all school activities as well as on school buses. Next slide. So those are the core standards that we've examined. Now let's take a look at uh, the State Honor Roll uh, tool itself, and we, I'm also going to highlight some of the new things that we're really excited about this year. The State Honor Roll tool can be found at, on our website, statehonorroll.org, and it's updated for 2014, and it shows an interactive map in which all states are profiled, and you can get to information about any state and the District of Columbia um, just by hovering your cursor over the state that you want to find out about and it will link you to an extensive profile and I'll give I will we'll, um, show you some screenshots of that profile in a couple of minutes it also includes um, policy highlights and gaps both uh, across the nation and for each state in particular we, we have added some policy standards for 2014 so the number of standards that we're looking at as core standards has increased from 18 to 23 and that was based on uh, the recommendations of our experts uh, last year that we expand the number of standards and frankly we um, eliminated one or two as well and finally we have a full update of where the nation stands related to epinephrine um, laws requiring or allowing epinephrine stocking in schools. And the report, as in prior years, is fully downloadable. Next slide. Okay, this is going to be our first screenshot of the landing page. When you go to statehonorroll.org, it will um, this is our portal, and it shows all. It's going to show all the resources for uh, the state honor roll report, including how to access the profiles of all 50 states and DC to see what those policies are that we've highlighted. And next page. This is going to take us to an interactive map, and this is our portal to each of those 50 state pro. 50 state and DC profiles and the state honor roll states are highlighted here in pink and the others are in blue but if you hover your cursor over any of them from the website you will uh, get a peek at the profiles of each of the states and I'm going to highlight on the beginning on the next page and we can go to the next page the first one of the profiles just as a sample and what we've highlighted here was I selected Mississippi. Mississippi is one of the new state honor roll um, states, ones that we've honored for 2014. And 
this is just a sample. All the other states are pretty much identical to this uh, in format. So each state has a profile it can be linked to from the interactive map. And each of these profiles is also included in the full report that can be downloaded from our website. So if you start at the top of the Mississippi profile, it shows uh, that Mississippi is an honor roll state. And the next line after the honor roll state designation in red shows that Miss, what, how Mississippi scored on the 23 policy standards that we measure and the 12 extra credit indicators that we look to. And it, we also take an in-depth look at each of the three major categories, beginning with the medication and treatment policies, and it lists each of the uh, policies on which Mississippi scored. And if you go to the next page, we'll show similarly how Mississippi scored on the assessment. I'm sorry, how Mississippi scored on the awareness policies and on the school environment policies. And on the next page, uh, which is represents the end of the state profile, uh, it shows a noteworthy section that highlights some of the noteworthy accomplishments that the state has made. Just before that, though, we highlight at the top of the page where I have circled um, the policy gaps. So for each of the states, we looked at the general areas where advocates can look if they're looking for ways to improve their policies um, on the whole. Next slide. Okay, now we're going to be moving to our big reveal, and these are the winners of State Honor Roll for 2014. So including Mississippi, we have one other new state uh, to our list of honorees, and that's West Virginia. And the other states are pretty much the same as in prior years. I will tell you, if you have an interest in Indiana, you might know that note that Indiana was included last year, but it is not included this year. And it's not because Indiana did anything to reduce its participation. It's because with 23 indicators, um, our scoring changed a bit, and, and uh, Indiana did not make the cut. And the cut this year, uh, we looked. To, we only included those states that scored 18 of these 23 score, core standards. We thought that 18 was an important number because 18 of 23 represents 80 percent, which is a B in most places. And we thought that any um, honor roll should be limited to those that score a B or better. And eight states made it in 2013, and we've increased that number to nine for 2014. And we have a lot of great expectation that we will at least increase that number by two in 2015. Uh, next slide. So areas of progress in general, um, the biggest area of progress this year is the same as it was last year, and that is the area of epinephrine auto-injector stocking laws. That's an area that really caught fire in 2014, and we're really pleased with that. And the, we've had over a dozen new states pass laws allowing schools to keep epinephrine auto-injectors on hand to treat anaphylaxis emergencies. And typically, these laws allow stock, both stocking and they provide for training and procedures related to emergencies. Some also provide shields. Uh, from liability, so that if a well-intentioned Good Samaritan um, acts when they think that a child is having an emergency, um, neither a parent, uh, the parent can't sue them or the school system. So other areas of progress include policies that require schools to identify and track students with asthma and those requiring smoke-free campuses. Next slide. I'm just going to highlight one section of the report, and this is a map that's it's not interactive, but it shows kind of our, our current box scores for states that um, allow stocking um, epinephrine in schools. And the blue states actually allow epinephrine stocking at this point. In fact, seven states now require schools to have policies for stocking epinephrine auto-injectors in schools. So in less than three years, the number of states 
that have these laws has quadrupled, and that's an amazing amount of progress in making state laws. The states that are shown in light blue are those where um, there have there are laws pending. So by and large, the map looks blue, and blue is a good thing. Next slide. The areas of policy gaps is something we're concerned about too, and states overall need better policies for um, to expand access to school nurses. They need better policies for indoor air quality practices, and uh, they need to be more consistent, and they need to fund staff training to uh, administer medications and to recognize the signs and symptoms of both anaphylaxis and uh, asthma emergencies. Next slide. So, okay. So, using the state honor roll, you know, what can we do to improve school health? Next slide. At this point, we're really speaking to advocates now because there are uh, many points of engagement uh, through which advocates, and that includes parents, school staff, you know, any interested people um, can engage with government to help to improve state laws and policies in, in the manner that we've been recommending. And one of those points of um, important points of engagement is the state legislature. Everyone, every state has a legislature. Those folks are elected to office, and they are concerned about uh, making sure they're meeting our needs. And this is the time of year, you know, fall, but late summer and fall is the time of year when state lawmakers are getting together informally to figure out what's going to be on their own agenda for the year. So this is a great time to begin to reach out to them with um, suggestions for new laws and policies, and. In addition, the state education departments play a big role in making these policies, putting these policies uh, into place, and when the laws are passed, implementing them uh, in, the, in the school system. And the local school districts play an important role as well. Um, add to that, there are roles played by the state health departments, potentially the state pharmacy boards if there are changes in medication laws and if schools are allowed to, um, to get uh, physicians to prescribe medications to them. And the environment's office is an important point of contact when it comes to indoor air quality. And finally, let's not forget the media. This is, any time is a great time if you can get your voice out and the media, news media provides an important point of contact. And their social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, there are opportunities to do blogs, letters to the editor, and so forth. Next slide. One of the key ways that uh, parents and you know anyone who's touched by food allergies can make a difference is to tell your story. Contact your state representative and state senator. We all, you know, in most states we all have you know one or two, and make sure that they understand uh, the situation from your standpoint. That there is a need for additional laws and policies to protect your child at school, and. Again, blogs, letters to the editors, sharing your story with other parents, all of those are great mechanisms for get, getting your story out. Practice your story. Make sure that you're telling a compelling story that really points to your personal situation. And when you have an opportunity, try to attend hearings. Try to make sure you're sending emails to um, your, your friends and colleagues and to other parents at schools. When there's an opportunity to testify, though, testimony can be really, really compelling. And if you want more information and you want to find uh, samples and statements, you can go to the website that we have listed here. Before we go to the next slide, I also want to, to um, let you know that uh, our foundation is also developing a toolkit specifically for um, parents who want to advocate on anaphylaxis. Next slide. Okay. And I'd like to close by thanking you and, again, thanking Mylan Specialty for providing support for the state honor roll. Thank you.
Thank you, Charlotte. Dr. Mike is now going to um, go on with his part of the presentation. All right. Well, thank you, Charlotte. Can you all can can everyone hear me? All right. Yes. All right. Wonderful. Um, and uh, um, this is a really amazing resource that AFR provides. This is fantastic. Um, and uh, what it helps us do is really get a sense for um, what is actually happening in our neck of the woods and what we can do about it. Um, now, just to kind of reinforce some of the things that you'll hear me um, say again and again and again until everybody wants to fall over, especially when it comes to the management of food allergy and anaphylaxis, is the importance of um, having practical food allergy management that's uh, implemented in all areas of a school by all school personnel um, when it comes to the kiddos uh, with food allergies and um, other life-threatening allergies. People will need to um, have two pillars that they implement, these two pillars of food allergy management. Without one, um, systems will fail um, and there is the potential for um, people to have anaphylaxis and um, not be treated appropriately. So implementing these principles of prevention and emergency preparedness in all settings is going to be absolutely key. So within the school building, um, there will need to be um, a system to act to prevent accidental exposures, to avoid accidental exposures with allergen, to communicate, to communicate throughout the school, throughout the building, from the staff to other staff, um, to the parents of kids without food allergies, to the parents of children with food allergies, um, kids with and without food allergies. It takes a unified school community to really support children with food allergies and other severe life-threatening allergies um, and to make them feel part of this school community and also be able to thrive and also be able to learn. Um, and to be able to bring this kind of community support, it's going to take teaching, where school nurses are absolutely critical players, not only in the management of food allergies, um, but in this education and educating the entire community. They are the, the, the key people who have access to teachers, to administration, custodians, school nutrition services, as well as parents um, and to the students. And so, a targeted education to each of the populations in a way that works with their role is really going to increase their own awareness and understanding and allow them to be able to support the children with food allergies and understand why it is that there are certain policies, some of the policies that Charlotte was just talking about and why those are being implemented in their states, why those are being implemented in their schools. Um, now as far as the pillar of emergency preparedness, um, Schools will need somebody who can recognize anaphylaxis, give epinephrine, and activate emergency response. Schools will need to be prepared to react. Um, and so all school staff members should be able to know the basic symptoms of an allergic reaction um, of anaphylaxis and know their role in their school's emergency protocol. They'll need to know how to flip that switch who to get, what to do. It may be them who may be um, a delegate. Um, it may be them who may be in some of our new states now that these new stock auto injector laws are coming out. They may be the ones who will ultimately give epinephrine if a school nurse is not immediately available. Um, there will need to be people who can administer epinephrine. Now, in the case of full-time school nurses, um, if they are immediately available, they are the ultimate. Um, school nurses have trained um, uh, to make assessments, uh, to care for children in emergency circumstances, um, and they are um, really the best equipped to be able to recognize anaphylaxis and treat um, and, um, and, and take care of business. Now, in the event that a school nurse is not immediately available, we absolutely need um, school staff who can recognize um, anaphylaxis and treat with epinephrine. And so these auto-injector laws that are popping up um, are absolutely key. Now, 
In the case of kids with known allergy, this is going to be a really important role. Oftentimes, this is called a delegate, where there will be somebody who could be trained um, who can give epinephrine to the known allergic reaction if a school nurse is not immediately available. Um, and now, what we also know from data from Massachusetts that 25% of the cases that required epinephrine um, were actually unknown to the school to have an allergy. Some of these people weren't just students. Some of these people were, were staff members and um, people visiting the school. Um, but up to 25% of people, um, it was unknown to the school, and they needed to be treated with uh, stock epinephrine, um, undesignated epinephrine, epinephrine that isn't necessarily meant for one particular student or person. Um, and so it is absolutely critical that epinephrine can be given to people experiencing anaphylaxis um, even when there is not a, a full-time school nurse available. Um, and now the ACT, the school will need to know how to activate emergency response. And so if anyone experiences anaphylaxis, they absolutely need to be taken to the emergency department by an ambulance. Um, now, we're not calling an ambulance because epinephrine is bad. We're calling an ambulance because it was a bad enough reaction to require epinephrine and somebody might need more and more care. Um, and uh, some data actually collected by Massachusetts school nurses did demonstrate that um, there were cases of people who had reactions en route to the hospital. So being in the ambulance is going to be absolutely necessary. This is important because some folks experience a biphasic reaction where the anaphylaxis is entirely treated and then comes back. In many cases, when it does come back, it's even more to treat than the first time. And then there are some people who are inadequately treated just with that first dose of epinephrine, and it does wear off, and they may need more, and they also might need fluid, oxygen, and then other, uh, other uh, medication as well. Um, and so now, these principles, these pillars, prevention and emergency preparedness, will need to be implemented in all areas of the school. Um, and uh, that'll be uh, something really important for um, all of our kids this school year. So Charlotte and Linda, I think that we're ready to advance and maybe, um, and this is where Charlotte, I'd invite you to chime in with me on this one, cannot drive home the importance of full-time school nurses anymore. Um, now, um, in some of our states, we're very lucky to have them. In some of our states, we're not. Um, now, this is something that really goes far beyond just kids with food allergies and kids who are at risk of anaphylaxis. And it goes to kids with epilepsy, um, just any child who potentially could have trauma in school, could have an emergency situation in school, kids with diabetes, you name it. Uh, kids these days have more complicated health issues. And um, now that, that, that we have amazing advances in, in health, we have kids who were ex-premies who are having higher care. We have children in schools with trachs. We have children in schools with G-tubes. We have lots of things that these school nurses are really um, bringing uh, to our kids and allowing them to learn. And so I really can't drive home the importance anymore of having full-time school nurses available from a safety issue. But now, one exciting thing um, in Massachusetts, a study just recently got published in JAMA um, Pediatrics demonstrating that full-time school nurses may actually save money for every dollar that was spent on Massachusetts school nurses in the year, it seemed that they brought back $2.20. Um, so they saved teacher time. They saved doctor time. They saved um, parents' time that would have had to otherwise call out from work. And so they really, really brought a lot, not only to the health of kids, not only to let kids learn, but also economically, they actually saved money. And so this should be a changing dialogue with our uh, school boards um, and with our states. I said a whole lot. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in? 
Uh, yeah, this is Charlotte. I, I absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more about the importance of school nurses. I'm, I'm only going to emphasize one uh, one area, though, that you didn't touch on directly, but is extremely important. These policies and training, I mean, they, they can be pretty complicated, and they really require some leadership. And most school systems, I think, justifiably look to that kind of leadership uh, from the school nurses. And the school nurses understand the, not just the school population, but they really are the go-to for finding out, is this really an emergency? What should I do? You know, how should, how should we react? And um, those next steps, not just in an emergency, but in um, any situation in which it's helpful to have someone with health care expertise along, is an important role played by school nurses. And they also play an important role in implementing uh, these policies on the school level and making sure that they're done in a way that's, you know, both practical and expeditious. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then that kind of leads me into school nurses really do play an absolutely essential role that goes beyond just what I mentioned about the emergency um, and then also education. They coordinate they are really positioned perfectly to be able to liaise between the families with kids with food allergies um, and other families and teachers and administration. Um, they are able to be there. They're in the building. They're able to attend meetings. Um, they really have this really key role as coordinators and they also have the ability to, to get in touch with healthcare providers and the families directly. Um, they are also advocates for the kids. Um, they're also um, responders, as I mentioned, they are trained to recognize uh, anaphylaxis and deal with emergency situations, and they have chosen this role, they have chosen this job, um, and they are ready for it. Um, and then, as I mentioned also, they are educators, and they educate the entire community. No one is better positioned to pull it off than they are. Uh, this is Linda. Um, if I could just jump in for a minute. Um, we showed a slide of the four different epinephrine autoinjectors, and in case Dr. Mike already said this, I'll just say it again. Make sure that if you, um, when you take the epinephrine autoinjectors to your school, that they are familiar with how to use it and that they know they have been trained on its correct um, use um, because all the different devices operate differently and there's different operating instructions. Um, and then this slide here is EpiPens for schools and you can um, work with your school to get up to four free epinephrine auto injectors from EpiPen um, at no cost to the school at all by visiting this website and having the school fill out the forms. I didn't mean to stop you Dr. Mike in case you oh, had no. more. Okay. Well, I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm open to us taking on questions if we have them um, okay. and having some open dialogue. Um, I think that we, we hit upon some of the core things, and you're absolutely right. Um, people getting comfortable training on the specific auto-injectors for the children is going to be really important, the children with known allergy. And then it's also going to be really important in the cases of the states where we do have these new stock auto-injector laws that they are trained on those that are available and stock for the buildings. Okay, great. Well, that pretty much wraps up the presentation by Dr. Mike and Charlotte, um, and I want to thank them for the wonderful presentation and all the new information they both were able to present. They, uh, we did get a number of questions and answers submitted prior to uh, the webinar, and so we've put them on slides and we'll go through them with you. Um, and uh, before we start on those, though, um, John Terry from the state of New York had a couple of updates that he private messaged during the presentation. Charlotte, do you want to comment on those? Well, sure. Uh, I, I mentioned that New York has uh, had a bill pending. He, John has announced to us that the um, bill has been passed and is awaiting Governor Cuomo's signature. Now, this is a bill that will, uh, and, and John, please correct me if I'm wrong on this, but this is the bill that finally allows students who have um, epinephrine auto injectors to keep them on their person at school and to administer to themselves. Uh, if they need it in an emergency. And I'm sure that the bill has other provisions as well, but uh, we have to uh, give some congratulations to John and the other advocates in New York. 
Absolutely. And then um, another person had asked a question, do these policy standards that you were talking about apply to private schools? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I, do, I did get that question. And, and there was another question, actually, about whether it covered preschool, daycare, and college, or only grade school. Grade school. The state honor, for the state honor roll report, we researched the laws that, that are applied, applicable to um, public schools K through 12. However, one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of these laws do apply to K through 12 and to private and charter schools, to non-public schools as well in some cases, but there may be some mechanism for them to opt in, uh, the private schools to opt in uh, in some cases. So there is some applicability, but uh, the state honor roll report looks at K through 12 and not at the pre preschool, daycare, and um, college policies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sorry, next, I, I think I jumped around a little bit on you. No, you did great. Um, next question, Mel, if you could advance the slide. How are states responding to e-cigarettes and vapes, and are these covered under smoking bans? For whoever su submitted this question, thank you very much. It's a great question. This is not a question that we specifically look at under state honor roll, but it is something that we're um, looking at very closely. E-cigarette regulation um, is regulation of these vaporized nicotine d delivery devices, basically. It's vaporized nicotine. And the FDA, or the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, has proposed banning e-cigarettes for minors. But its proposed regulation doesn't really go a whole lot farther than that, or at least not as far as we'd like it to go, because it would still allow candy-flavored or dessert-flavored um, e-cigarettes and other tobacco products. And we think that uh, these are really just a gateway. And rather than, um, rather than discouraging people or helping them uh, give up this um, serious addiction, it may just be a gateway for young people and people who've never smoked um, into the world of nicotine addiction. So in, in advance of FDA regulations, there are some states that are stepping up. And according to an article that I um, read in the Boston Globe, all but 11 states are regulating e-cigarettes in some way. And I found out from one of my colleagues at the American Thoracic Society, Nuala Moore, um, said that Rhode Island and Connecticut have passed or enacted bans on the sale of e-cigarettes to minors. Uh, Utah, North Dakota, and D.C. have included e-cigarettes as part of their indoor smoking bans and Minnesota has imposed an excise tax on them. So I think one of the things that we're really looking for with um, some, we really want to encourage states to regulate in this manner. I don't think that FDA regulation is ever going to be so extensive as to include e-cigarettes as part of their indoor smoking, uh, any indoor smoking bans, because they really don't have them, and it's up to the states to do that. Okay, uh, next slide. Are there any special laws for children with multiple food allergies? Okay, well, I, I can take a crack at that, um, Mike. I, but I don't, I, I'll take a crack at it, to, which is to say, I don't know of any, so. Yeah, and, and I think that, that, or I know that there isn't any specification between individual and multiple, but especially now that we have the CDC voluntary guidelines out, we have the guidelines that are popping out for the different specific states. We have these really awesome tools to address food allergy management in general. When you have a school that implements a policy that addresses food allergies in general appropriately, it's going to take care of the kiddo with multiple food allergies. It's going to take kiddo, care of the kiddos with individual food allergies. This is where sometimes things can get a little confusing or tricky if people are targeting one particular allergen, like peanut allergy, for example. But if policies are implemented that really address food allergies in general, then it really will take care of the kiddos with whatever they're allergic to and even the kids with multiple allergies. Okay, great, Dr. Mike, thank you. 
How is compliance with state laws and policies measured? Okay, for the state honor roll, we look at um, whether the states require or mandate policies for every school in the state. And if they don't make that, then they don't score uh, for that, that policy or um, for that policy standard. Simply advising or making a recommendation that school districts adopt a policy is not enough to meet our standards. There is, however, one exception to that, and that is with the nurse-to-student ratio. The, the standard that we use is one, one nurse per 750 pupils, and we have not really found a state except one that requires that. And there are a number, though, who recommend ratios, and there are a number who do some innovative things that um, make sure that there are um, school nurses available during the school day for students, and we try to recognize that. An example is Delaware, which has a school nurse uh, in every school. Um, Charlotte, somebody asked if um, there's a way to actually look up what the policy is for an individual state. Yes. That, that using the prof there, well, there are actually two ways of doing that, and the simplest way I would recommend is to simply go to our website, statehonorroll.org, and on that home page there is the map, and go to the state that you want to look up um, the, the the score for the policies for, and it will um, link to the um, profile of that state. And that's really the easiest way to get at it. It also includes the scoring for that state. Uh, the second way is in the downloadable uh, full report, which can be downloaded, again, from the same website, statehonorroll.org. Uh, there is a listing for every state, which is the policies. And you can link to that um, uh, in, in the full report. And finally, there is a chart for each of the honor roll states indicator, so you can get um, the full layout for each honor roll state, as well as for all of the 50 states uh, and the charts for each of the core policy indicators and the state um, state's extra credit indicators. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to stop for a minute. Brenda Sylvia Torma uh, gave us another reminder, which is a good one, and that is when you go to pick up the auto injectors for back to school, make sure that the ones that you are receiving are the ones that match up with the prescription you dropped off. Uh, some of the pharmacies in the Northeast and the Western states are um, allowing um, pharmacists to substitute generics for the brand, and so you might wind up with one that requires different kinds of training than the one that you are expecting to get. So um, check your prescriptions when you leave the pharmacy. Thank you, Brenda. Do we have another question and answer? We. I'm sorry. Oh, Did Linda. You, uh, yes. Yeah, Linda. I think there was a, there was an, an, a question um, about whether Iowa had pending legislation for stock epinephrine, and I looked that up. The answer is no. Uh, the The map that uh, we showed you, that's on our website, does um, indicate those states that have pending legislation for stock epinephrine, and Iowa is not one of them. But okay. and let me add, too, that in the last uh, three weeks, two states um, enacted laws on stock epinephrine, Delaware and North Carolina. They had had pending laws for some time. Uh, North Carolina has had a really long um, process toward trying to get a law. And both laws, I'm happy to report, mandate that schools keep um, epinephrine on hand. So I think we need to celebrate those, those advocates as well. Absolutely. And um, we might as well do the, um, the advocacy promo here. Um, if you're in Iowa and you want to get involved in advocacy in your state, um, you can always contact the AFA office in Charlotte's department to get some advice on how to proceed. So um, we'll be putting up more contact information later on. Um, let's see. Do you have examples of how a state or school is implementing protective policies for students with asthma and allergies? I'll tr try to take a stab at that. 
We really would like to hear more about how states are going about implementing these policies. Um, occasionally, we, well, uh, more often actually, we do hear from school administration and school nurses who are really coming together in groups to look at their state laws and work with um, education officials to come up with uh, policies and training uh, material and so forth. And we do have access to some that um, some states have come up with, but we would really like to hear more. Mike, do you and have anything to add? Go ahead. Yeah, you know, this is a very uh, amazing time um, and, and a challenging time because a lot of these uh, stock auto injector laws are just being implemented this new school season, and this is uncharted territory. The training of um, non-licensed people to recognize first-time anaphylaxis and treat with epinephrine is a challenge. Um, and we really don't know how things are, we have no data. Um, there isn't a lot of information that we have out there. Um, and the longer we go on doing this, the more data we're going to get, the more we're going to learn, and the more we're going to be able to tighten things up. Um, and right now, as, as um, Charlotte can attest to, is that each state and even each locale may do things a bit differently. And so right now, trying to find the winning combination is going to also be um, very challenging. And there's such humongous differences from state to state, with some states having excellent school nurse ratios, some states having very poor school nurse ratios. There's going to be differences that are going to come into um, how do you effectively train people when you have one school nurse who is responsible for six to 10,000 students and five buildings? Um, it's going to be a very different circumstance than when you have a full-time school nurse in a building who's responsible for about 700 kids and knows the, the staff deeply and is able to have access to people and to be able to train. So each of these states that's rolling out these laws is going to be going through very different challenges and each one might have their own strengths. Thank you. Uh, next question. Are classroom birthday parties covered in the state honor roll? No, the answer to that is no. It, it, the, again, the state honor roll looks at um, the, the, the broad comprehensive policies that states are enacting. And to my knowledge, states are not enacting policies um, at the state level that um, control birthday party practices in the schools. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can, if you're comfortable talking about the USDA and the competitive foods issue and how there's going to be wellness policies that schools are required to, to develop. Oh, I'm comfortable talking about it. Just give me a time limit. I'll try to <laughs> cover this really briefly. Sure. So, um, yeah, and, and thanks for raising that. The Food and Drug Administration is uh, looking at school wellness kind of across the board and how to integrate um, school wellness policies and you know what communities need to do to come together to get uh, school boards to pick up school wellness policies and to give them the get to give school systems a template for moving forward with schools school wellness policies it's less prescriptive than it is um, it will be less prescriptive I think than it is advisory and they ask for comments um, about this uh, uh, I guess several months ago and hopefully they'll come forward with um, comprehensive school wellness policies and food policies um, and we have asked that they take a look at uh, making sure that the food allergy um, parents and, and children are taken into account and that they look to um, other recommended policies um, that have been created by the, uh, with that interest, by the um, Centers for Disease Control. How did I do? Linda, do you want to add Good. anything? No, no. But um, well, the only other thing is that the um, the wellness policies that the final rule will will come out with will require school districts to set up wellness committees, and then the, those wellness committees will be charged with developing policies. And you know, we we ask that 
when those schools put together their committees that they incorporate um, consideration for things like the CDC guidelines which you know advocate for say non-food celebrations and things like that for all children not just for ones with food allergies so um, hopefully in a, in a backdoor kind of way they will be addressing that birthday party issue. Dr. Mike did you want to add anything to that? I think what you just said um, was was absolutely adequate. Okay. Okay. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, are we kind of at the end of the questions? Um, I well, I do have another question, and this came to me offline from one of the participants on the call, and that is, uh, Dr. Mike mentioned the school nurse study about the uh, you know save cost savings. I'm sorry, um, monetary savings. Um, across the community because of the presence of school nurses and is there any way that you have a reference to that and um, can you share a link with link on that yes uh, I believe the last the the, the lead author um, Wang and it's JAMA pediatrics and then what we'll do is we'll uh, uh, we'll find the uh, the PubMed link and uh, and 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 Linda, I, I think we could probably get that up somewhere, right? We we always send out a um, a link to a blog post that contains the archived copy of the um, webinar and a, a list of resources, so we can include that in the list of resources. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have one other question that came in, and I'm hope I'm going to say this correctly, um, it's do you consider, quote, allow school nurse or other trained personnel to administer epinephrine auto-injector to student who has never been diagnosed with a food allergy an indicator in your report? Can you repeat that again? Um, yes. It's, it's basically, do you have an indicator for undesignated use of epinephrine in your report? Yes, we do. It, it shows up uh, directly. We we, one of our indicators is does the state require schools to have uh, that policy in place and that's included among our extra credit indicators um, and we also have a couple that pretty much these laws are also including related to protocols and to um, you know, does, does this, in other words, does the state require the schools to set up emergency protocols related to anaphylaxis? And does the state um, have the and do this? Does the state require the schools to uh, set up Good Samaritan laws that shield people who, you know, again, well-meaning people who are trying to help from uh, liability for their actions if they're unintentional? And those are include those two are included among our uh, core uh, standards. Thank you. Okay, well we're just about wrapped up. I think we covered or tried to cover just about everybody's questions today. Um, Charlotte and Dr. Mike, I'm very grateful for your coming. You both did a wonderful job as always. And um, I'm going to go ahead and move ahead and give um, out the giveaways we have. First we have two um, gift baskets from Dr. Lucy, which is a wonderful allergy friendly company. And if you just bear with me for a minute, I have to look for the names of the winners. Uh, Dr. Lucy, Product winners are Mandy Ingram and Amber Doherty. Congratulations to both of you. We'll be in touch to confirm your mailing address. We can get those off to you. And then the Sun Butter giveaways are, um, are won by Janine, oh, J Jani Powers and Liliana Harjoko. I hope I didn't butcher your name too much. Um, I apologize about that. Um, so congratulations to all of all four of you, and we'll be in touch to verify um, within the next few days. If you don't hear from us by say Monday, give us a holler at um, info at kidswithfoodallergies.org. Uh, the next webinar we're going to have is actually later this month. We had so many questions about 504 plans that we actually are going to have a dedicated webinar just to have your questions answered. That's going to be on Tuesday, August 26 with attorney Laurel Francoeur. Laurel did a 504 and IHCP webinar, which is an 
um, individualized health care plan. These are school plans um, back in January, and she rocked the house. We have that archived video on our website, which you can um, also view for free. Um, but then in addition to that, we got a lot of questions, and this is when she's going to answer those questions for you. So um, it will be a really informative and interesting webinar, and I encourage you to sign up. It'll be free. Um, we will be sending you the invitation to sign up when we send you the archive copy of this video. So um, thank you again. Um, I'd like to close with a few comments. First of all, Kids with Food Allergies is part of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. We're the nation's oldest and largest asthma and allergy charity. If you found today's session valuable and would like to see that we continue this webinar series and our other education programs, please consider keeping KFA and AFA in your individual giving plans. So with that, I'm going to say thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your staying here with us, and have a great day. Bye.